Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we have Dr. Jop Norl from Henk in Belgium. We'll be talking about tractal cancer treatment options for a colorectal surgeon. Thank you, Dr. Jop, for doing this, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. We had a good time when you were visiting us in, the, in Genk Hospital. So we shared some opinions, which was, uh, which was very nice. Um, I have quite a lot of uh, slides. So if I'm, you know, if it's not clear or anything, just, uh, just stop me or ask me whatever you want to do. Okay. So I will first um, introduce myself. So I'm working in the hospital of Genk. We have a hospital of around uh, 750, 800 beds that we're working together with a uh, hospital close by. So in total, we have around 1,000 beds. Um, I just wrote down the, the website of our uh, department because I think it's very nice because we have a very nice uh, treatment overview. and We have uh, folders with information with QR codes you can, you can scan. You can see the team there, uh, which is not important. We try to uh, organize the colorectal clinic uh, on two days a week. So we organize this on the Monday and the Wednesday, and we try to have all the patients for colorectal surgery on those, uh, on those two days, because then we can all gather the data. We can have a clinical nurse being with us um, and we can plan the patient right away. We, we try to have um, the colorectal procedures um, divided uh, between three surgeons. And so uh, I think I do most of the colorectal procedures and then Kim Govarts and uh, Dr. Van der Speter, Kurt Van der Speter is uh, also doing uh, high back and debulking surgery and pelvic accentuations. I also work in Sicily, in Italy. Italy is a very nice place and the professor of surgery in Catania uh, invited me to do more extensive and more difficult procedures, minimally invasive with uh, the laparoscope. He doesn't have a robot. I also uh, teach uh, in Italy, uh, teaching anatomy and uh, embryology and, and uh, surgery related anatomy as well. So I, I go there once a month just to teach surgery and to perform surgery as well. Besides that, I have my own foundation. I'm the, I'm the main founder and the co-founder of uh, a, a, a teaching site, which is called iLab Surgery. It's called iLabSurgery.be. So you can, you're really invited to go to the website because I think there's a lot of information about uh, minimum invasive um, colorectal procedures, also liver surgery with a lot of drawings, with a lot of 3D animation. So I think we can still improve the website, but, uh, but I think there's a lot to find actually. One of the, one of the parts of the ILAP Surgery Foundation is concerning ILAP rectum. So this is just about rectum. A lot of chapters of rectal cancer surgery, but also about anatomy from Professor Hield, uh, embryology from Calvin Coffey, radiology from, uh, from uh, Gina Brown. So I think there are a lot of uh, very nice presentations of all uh, well-known experts, actually. The idea to start the ILAP Surgery Foundation came actually uh, many years ago, 2015 where I submitted a video for uh, the best surgical video of 2012 for the American College of Surgeons. And the video I submitted was the prize winning video, number one, uh, number one video. And that was because I added colors to the surgical planes. So I added this all myself. I, I, I put masks on the surgical planes and that's why you really see the embryological layers in a splenic flexure mobilization. And so we try to add those kind of colorized videos to um, our website. And this was a prize winning, winning video, which is for free accessible on our website. So you can really go for free and, and join us and you can even send us beautiful videos so we can submit them and put them on the, on the website. We have presentations from Mariana Berro on pathology, Calvin Coffey on embryology. We have Gina Brown giving a 30 minute talk about rectal cancer anatomy and and I think it's very nice to just go there by yourself and, and have your residents and fellows uh, go go to the ILAP surgery website actually uh, try to oh okay we also have beautiful videos from uh, professor Ayan Kuzu from Istanbul who 
for rectal cancer surgery, um, made all the structures clear. And I think for teaching, uh, teaching reasons, it is really beautiful to, to show anybody. So we have many experts working on the website. Coming to, to rectal cancer treatment or rectal lesion treatment, I, I think we have exciting times because I think there are a lot of uh, strategies you can choose. And so I want to go into detail in some of them. I want to talk about TME as a gold standard. Of course, the, the restrictions for TME. And I also want to go a little bit further to beyond TME, which is TATME, transgenal TME and robotic surgery. Thomas Plus, for which you can use Thomas, and of course the watch and wait uh, strategy. So I have like four parts in my presentation. Talking about rectal cancer surgery, this is one of the illustrations that is on my website from the ILAP surgery website about the holy plane of rectal cancer surgery. The, the big thing that Professor Hield really described was the holy plane of rectal cancer surgery, in which he means that you have to. Um, um, isolate the pedicle package, which is the rectum or colon higher up, but we're talking about rectum, the rectal package, a cancer package with the rectum, with the meso rectum, with all the, with all the nodes around it. And we have to separate this in the pelvis from the paired structures on the side. So all the retroperitoneal structures are paired, the two urethra, the vessels, the, the, the nerves, and so we have to save the nerves and take out the pedicle package, actually. And so this is the big contribution of Professor Hield. This is a video or an animation, 3D animation we try to, to work on. So you have your midline structure, you have your, your GI tract from the mouth to the anus, which is surrounded by the visceral peritoneum going to the backside of the human body. And then you have the parietal peritoneum, which is purple on the side. And of course, you have your dream, three main vessels, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery that goes through the GI tract. And the fascinating thing, actually, is that between the seventh and twelfth week of embryological development, everything starts to rotate and elongate and, um, uh, and, 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 and making a sac like the stomach. You have your pancreatic butt and your liver butt. And so... While the liver enlarges, the, the bowel is pushed outside of the abdomen, and, and therefore um, you can end up with an embryological defect and open abdomen. But at the end of the 12th week, everything falls back into place, and those main three vessels, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery, are back in place for the upper abdomen, the mid abdomen, and the lower abdomen. And so I think this is what actually Bill, me, Bill Hilt uh, wants to show. And therefore, as a result, we have reproducibility. So we can have a universal reproducible uh, procedure um, to separate uh, the pedicle package from the surrounding tissue. And that's the only way you can really teach people around the world or your own residents or your fellows because you have to show the surgical planes and instead of tearing it out of the human body, you really have to follow the planes and work in those avascular planes actually. By now, by doing that, by improving surgery by Professor Bill Hield, he showed in the early days, like in the, the early 80s, early 90s, he showed that a TME compared to conventional surgery at that time in the Mayo Clinic, because these are data from Cook Mortel from Mayo Clinic, when he compared the historical data from Cook Mortel, either by conventional surgery and radiotherapy and chemotherapy, or only surgery and radiotherapy, he showed that the results of only TME without radiotherapy, without chemotherapy, were better than what happened at that time in Mayo Clinic. And actually nobody believed Bill Hield. Everybody said that he was a, a liar until John McFarlane from Australia visited him in Basingstoke. And so he's down at the bottom side here and he checked all the results and he checked all the prospective results and he showed actually that Bill Hield was really right. And by teaching this and going around the world, many big centers at that time um, implemented the TME surgery and that this is what happened actually. So what happened in, in the Swedish trial in Sweden, so the Stockholm results uh, and the Stockholm surgeons and the Swedish surgeons 
went in the TME project and they saw that the two years local recurrence rate dropped from 14, 15% to 6%. So they actually proved that the results of Professor Bill Heald were, were really right and reproducible. These are results from the Dutch TME trial published in 2002 in the British Journal of Surgery, and they actually showed the same. So the local recurrence rate after two years dropped from 16% conventionally surgery at that time to 9%, and also the overall, overall survival improved a lot. And from that time, actually, TME became the gold standard for radical rectum resection. Now, what we also know, and that's my, my other topic, of course, is that for all of us doing rectal cancer surgery, it's not always that easy. So if you look at a subgroup of patients from the Dutch TME trial, and these are only 180 non-irradiated patients, they were judged on the specimen by a pathologist and the pathologist had to say whether it was a perfect specimen, a complete TME, or near complete, so some ruptures, or incomplete TME. Incomplete TME was like big tears, incomplete specimen, not very well done, not very well surgery, but not very well surgery was done in one out of four patients. So 24% of patients, one out of four, was not operated well. Although Professor Bill Hill tried to show this very well, but you know sometimes it's very difficult. If you look at the distal one third of the rectum compared to the proximal two third of the rectum, you see that only four out of 10, four out of 10 patients have a complete TME specimen. So this means that six out of 10 patients has a nearly complete or incomplete uh, TME in the most distal part of the rectum. As we know, this is the most difficult part. I have to go back here. Because for me as a rectal cancer surgeon, I think rectal cancer surgery only starts from the mid pelvis to the pelvic floor. The upper rectum is actually not very, very difficult. And in many patients, this is not the most difficult part, but from the mid pelvis to below, it becomes more and more difficult. Part of that is because of the size of the pelvis. If you compare male patients on the right side to female patients, we know that on every level of the pelvis, pelvic inlet, mid pelvis and pelvic outlet, the diam diameter in male patients is always less than in female patients. But especially the mid pelvis has the lowest diameter. So this means that going down in the pelvis to the pelvic floor, this works like a kind of hourglass where you have to come down in the lowest bubble. So this makes it very difficult. We know also in male patients that not only the bony pelvis, but also the size of the prostate is very important. If you have a big prostate, the working space is very limited besides the fact that you have a smaller pelvis. So sometimes it's just very difficult to mobilize the distal part of the rectum. Last but not least, we also know that the current staplers we have from all kinds of companies are mostly restricted to 45 degrees angulation. So if you want to try and have a perpendicular stapling of the distal rectum, this becomes very difficult. And this is a small study done by Anne Bannigan and Andre Dora in Leuven in Belgium. And they tried to make like a, a module to show that if you need, or if you want a perpendicular stapling of the distal rectum, you actually need a stapling of 65 degrees. And so many surgeons to get that perfect stapling do kind of a compensatory measure by stapling it vertically. And that's the same thing we actually do with the robotic stapler nowadays. Most robotic surgeons, you will see having a vertical stapling, but that's a bit of a compensatory measure as well to overcome the problem that it's very difficult to staple it off distally in a perpendicular way. And so when you have a patient with multiple factors that increase the level of difficulty, rectal cancer surgery is just very difficult. These are the size of the prostate, the diameter of the pelvis, so also male and female gender, male gender especially, a suboptimal uh, interval after radiotherapy, the size of the tumor, not only the size of the prostate, but also the size of the tumor, the tumor location, if you have a located tumor, which is like obstructing or is 
is fixated posteriorly, it's very hard to get in that pill bell a perfect uh, avascular plane on the posterior side. Of course, tumor is very close to the anorectal junction, so the lower border of the, of the upper border of the sphincter, and of course, obese male patients. So when you have these factors increasing, the level of difficulty increases, and the quality of surgery has a big chance to decrease, actually. Let me see why. And therefore, a um, solution could be to do a transanal TME, doing the last part from below, or at um, uh, articulating uh, instruments in robotic TME. So that's, that's what I want to talk about. So if you go beyond the open or laparoscopic TME, we have to talk about TA TME and robotic surgery. Now, in Europe, I don't know, in your country or in your area, there's a big discussion going on between the TA and TME surgeons going from below or the robotic surgeons. So you kind of are a TATME or field or a, a, a TATME loving surgeon or a robotic field. I love both. I do robotic surgery. I do TA TME, but I try to show you, you know, what are the advantages of both techniques. If you look at this, this is an example of how you perform the TA TME. So you have two teams. You have the patient put in Trendelenburg after you have done the splinting flexion mobilization. This is also on the ILAP surgery website, this animation. You drape the person, uh, the patient, you add in your trocars, you use mainly an air seal insufflator from below. And then after mobilizing the splenic flexure and going down in the pelvis, you call your second surgeon and you work from both sides towards each other to reach each other somewhere on the pelvis or I mean on the prostate or on the, on the vagina. And you work as a separate team uh, until you meet. So you have your transanal screen, you have your abdominal screen, you work and work in two teams. You have a laparoscope from above, you have a team from, from below, but you have to really focus on all those aspects, how to work together. Because in the beginning, those are separated operations, but at the end, you have the two teams working together and you have to know as a transanal surgeon, how the anatomy is from below. I think this is very crucial. So this is just a animation to show um, how you have to work together in an OR. We published a lot of uh, aspects on transanal TME. So we try to publish on the steps of TA TME, do a good digital exam, bring in the platform, do a perfect purse string, a washout, a start of the dissection at around five o'clock on this side, then a full thickness dissection all the way around, going from posterior to anterior to the side, and then deliver the specimen transanally or transabdominally. But you really have to respect all those factors because if you don't do this, a bad digital exam, not really have an idea where you are compared to the anorectal junction, a bad purse ring or a bad washout, you get into trouble. And that's exactly what happened in a study done in Norway. And this is the Norway moratorium in which they had really bad results. And in Europe, this is like used now to kind of condemn the TA TME because the results were bad. But if you look at this paper, it's actually a technical problem, in my opinion. So they had seven hospitals between 2014 and 2018 compared TA TME to the National Control Group of Rectal Cancer Surgery. What came out after three years was a local recurrence rate in the TA TME group of almost 12%, which is horrible, of course, compared to 2.4%. So this is really unacceptable. But I think it's very important to know that from the seven hospitals, three hospitals were abandoned because they only did in the first year, one, one, and three TA TMEs. So they never even tried to get over their learning curves. The other four hospitals did between 32 and 57 cases between 2014 and 2018. So they did on average 11 TA TMEs per hospital per year. Some hospitals did only eight per year. What they saw is that 12% of the lesions were high rectum. So why do you do TA TME for a high rectal lesion? It's unlogic. And uh, the name TA TME, it's not TA PME. You know, it's not transanal partial mesorectal excision. So it's very unlogic 
to do a transanal dissection for a high rectal lesion is not necessary. Just you dissect five centimeters below the cancer, you staple it off, you do an estomosis. They also saw that in the control group, they doubled the amount of gamma radiation therapy. So the control group was actually better treated upfront than the TATME group. And also they saw that in the local recurrence group of TATME, a lot of patients were treated without neoadjuvant treatment, although they had a PTT31, N1, N2, T4, N2, T2, N2, they had local recurrence great group. Some patients had a CRM of zero. So, so this is actually not very well operated. And I think for having a bad purse string, they had a higher rate of local recurrences that were multifocal. So I think this was a big problem of the study. So to me, this is more a lack of technique, a lack of experience and a lack of selection. So I think it's unfair to really compare and I show you my own results or our own results afterwards. If you do TATME, you really have to know about all technical procedural components of TATME. You have to know the risk. You have to know how to avoid the problems. You have to know how to see the anatomy from below. And you have to have a structured training to optimize teaching. If you start anywhere in the world, you need a proctor to come to you three times, five times until you really know what you're doing and what you're seeing. What we also did is that we modified the classification of Eric Rullier a little bit. Eric subdivided four types, type one, type two, type three, and type four. If you do TATME, it's very crucial that you don't bring in your device, you don't bring in your Thomas board or your TEM device if you don't have at least two centimeters between the top of your device and your lower board of the rectal cancer. Because if you don't have two centimeters, you're kind of touching the tumor and it's impossible to do a perfect purse strain. So it's impossible. So you have to know that if you do TATME, it's better to kind of subclassify between type 1A, 1B, 2, 3, and 4. 1A is two centimeters and higher. So not so difficult lesions. Type 1B is a lesion with the lower border between one and two, so pretty low. Type two are the lesions within one centimeter. So as the lesion is at 0.6 centimeter from the sphincter, we call it type two. Type three is um, invading the internal sphincter and type four is invading the external sphincter. So we kind of reduce TATME to mainly 1B, and two nowadays. So mainly within the last two centimeters, and especially within the last centimeters, we don't start with the device. We just mobilize the rectum. We mobilize this for two, three centimeters, and then we start. I will show you that. You also have to know about the differences between TATME and any technique from above, either robotic or open or laparoscopic. It doesn't matter. If you come from below, you insufflate CO2 transanally. You also start with an open rectal stump because through the anus, you close the rectum and then you go around the rectum to free up all the mesorectum, which means that you open at the end with an open rectal stump. This is very important and different from most techniques from above. And also, which is very important, if that you have to be careful if you start very low, not on the prostate with your device, but below it, when you dissect too far anteriorly, you might damage the urethra below the prostate. If you work in a more too much anteriorly, you can damage the urethra here. This is what I wanna show you, but it's all on the website. You will work in a very small area compared to your abdominal cav cavity. So you work in a very small area if you have the CO2 insufflation set up too high, you can really have kind of an auto dissection by the insufflation, which is not very good for a perfect TME dissection. And you could have a CO2 embolism. Also, when you work with your device from the start at the level of the prostate, the urethra at this level is never at, is never at risk. 
But if you start lower, below the size of the prostate, the level of the prostate, you could be headed too far anteriorly and you could damage the urethra below the prostate. And so this is very scary if you are not trained and if you are trained, it should be saved. I never had a CO2 embolism. I never had a conversion. I never had a uterine lesion actually. And you have at the end, because you have an open rectal stump, you have to know how to do the anastomosis. And this is actually what now is promoted by Antonino Spinelli. He calls it TTSS. But all the TATME surgeons say, you know, this is what we did in TATME. So why do you put your name on it while well, it's already there? You know, it's TTSS is actually what we are doing in TATME for years. So now we try to avoid stapling when we are too low. If you are too low, within that last centimeter from the anorectal junction, from the sphincter, you try to avoid stapling it together because you could implement some sphincter tissue. And in those cases, when you start with, without your platform, we do a manual anastomosis at the end. So this is the manual anastomosis. We do interrupted sutures, Fibril 3.0, hand sewn in those patients. So this is all on the, on the web search, uh, website. So you can really find it there. We have to understand that this is a difficult technique. So if you look at other techniques like laparoscopic light, left-sided colon resection, laparoscopic right-sided colon resection, laparoscopic hemihepatectomies, you need around 40, 50, 60 cases to overcome your learning curve. So if you do TATME and you work in a hospital where you only do 20 rectal cancers a year and you do some with TATME, you do only five TATMEs a year, it costs you eight years to be sufficient and to do it safe, but you're not maintaining your, your level of skills. So if you work in a small hospital, you can discuss whether you have to do rectal cancer surgery, but definitely if you have to do TATME, because it's a difficult technique. I think we have to know that. And this also counts for robotic surgery as well. Now, this is a video of a TATME case within a hospital. I just show you how it goes. So Professor Bill Heald was a moderator. And this was actually a case of that patient with that big prostate that I showed you the tennis ball. So this is the guy who doesn't have a very small pelvis, but he has a big prostate down in the pelvis. And so my colleague is operating from above. He's just isolating the inferior mesenteric artery. And I'm starting at that time from below. And now in a second, you will see both teams operate. So he's, I speeded it up a little bit. So he's trying to isolate laparoscopically the inferior mesenteric artery. And at the same time, I'm operating from, from below. So this is the inferior mesenteric artery. We clip the artery, we take the artery. And now he has to go and down into the pelvis. And you will see that because the guy is, is pretty obese, but especially a big prostate, he is making only a little bit of pro, pro, uh, progress. While I was doing from below a much faster job, seeing the tumor, seeing the distal margin. And on the right side of the screen, you will see that I do a pushing technique. I push the specimen up. I'm not tearing the specimen. I'm not tearing this apart. Well, here on the left side has a more difficult job. So I'm just pushing with my gauze and just dissecting off the mesorectum and working cranially while he works from above distally. You see the big size prostate here. So we have only a small area of dissection. And so I can just push with my gauze and just make a lot of progress while he on his side, this synchronized images, is not making perfect progress. So you see the big side of the prostate. Now we come together at that time, you have to level the uh, pressure from above and below to the same level. And then you have to finish the dissection and you can talk to each other and, and, and uh, work as a team actually at that time. So I can have traction and counter traction from one side, he can do the dissection or the other way around. So I'm making the traction for my colleague I'm doing that much, and then he's doing the dissection, or you can work the other way around. And then you free up the whole specimen in this, in the lower pelvis patient with a small area of dissection. 
at the end we extracted, Bill Hield was, uh, was satisfied and we showed the specimen and he liked the specimen. We had a small little tear here, but the rest was really a perfect specimen actually and not a very easy patient actually. So I think still TATME, although we do it less than before, is very, very helpful, especially in those patients with multiple factors that increase the difficulty of dissection, obesity, big prostate, small pelvis, um, big tumor, and especially also when you want to see the distal margin. Many surgeons, they dissect onto the pelvic floor. They feel from below, and they feel actually say now, oh, here the tumor is here, so I can staple. And they don't know if they have a margin of one, two, three centimeters. They have no idea. So I like to see really where my distal margin is in those very low lesions to know that I'm not too close to the rectal cancer, especially in this era where we have a lot of radio chemotherapy, a lot of TNT schedules, sometimes with very small tumors. I rather see the lower border of the tumor than just feel a little scar. So that's what I, I really want to know. I want to know my distal margin in those very low lesions, actually. These are the results that uh, we have. We uh, looked at the first 90 patients we did because we want to see and divide it in three groups of 30, 30, 30, 30. We had a ratio male, female, seven to three. We had in this first experience, pretty much patients that were two centimeters and higher. So pretty higher lesions. Only 20% were in the last two centimeters. 8% of total were in that last one centimeter. So where you need to start intersphincteric, do a dissection, bring in the device and then start. We had no conversions, no urethral lesions, no CO2 embolisms. And we found comparing 30, 30 and 30, in a 90 patients group that you need around 40 cases as well to have experience and to overcome your learning curve as in all difficult techniques. Anastomotic leakage, 4.4%, 2.2 early, 2.2 afterwards. We had a 2.2 local recurrence rate. Um, I have to go back, recurrence rate. We didn't have any multifocal lesions. So we didn't have the problems that the Norwegian group has. If we look at the results of the last patient, the last two years, we had a little more than 30 patients in the last two years. And we see that we had much more patients in the last two centimeters. And those were the patients that had a hand-sewn anastomosis. So compared to our first experience, we keep TAT me now, especially for the lower lesions, and especially to see the distal margin in very small lesions or extremely low lesions. That's, what, that's actually what we do now. Robotic TME, we have two robots in our hospital. Our department has almost daily access to the robot now. I really love the robot, I really love it. But especially when, when I want to see the distal margin, I think it's sometimes better to do or to add TA TME. This is a little video of a robotic case in a obese male patient. So this is together with Amjad, Amjad Parfait is a surgeon that operates in Qatar and in um, Portugal. So you have your three instruments and your uh, camera. So your camera is very stable, much more stable than when your assistant is holding the camera. We do the posterior side, you use one hand for traction and two hands to work. So this is counter traction and working arm. I like to work with two right hands, you have to choose whether you have two left hands or two right hands. I like to work with two right hands. This is the prostate, the seminal vesicles. You can really get traction and counter traction, but you're kind of pushing on the specimen uh, anyway, like you do with every technique from above. You're using a gauze to really protect the specimen. You see this is a ob obese male patient, difficult case. And although the dissection went very well, we, we had some trouble in stapling this off uh, distally because it was a very low lesion and we were kind of feeling with our finger whether we had a enough distal margin although we were on the pelvic floor so you see that you have to kind of compensate with your stapler a little bit because it's impossible to have a perfect perpendicular stapling and that's why all robotic surgeons 
turn the staple and do kind of a, a vertical stapling, but then you don't really know where you are for those very low lesions between one and two centimeters. What is your distal margin? That's actually the question. We are also checking now uh, whether we can combine robots with, I have to go to the next slide, robot with TATME. So for the very low lesions, we're just checking if that's uh, worth the effort. Um, I'm, I'm not sure yet because the guy that's sitting and doing the transanal part, it's really stuck between the arms of the robot or although we added now a, a small screen for the transanal surgeon so he can really look over here and, and perform the surgery here. And we just combine this for the last little bit of the surgery now coming ab from above with the robot actually to, um, to help us, especially in, in uh, obese male patients. This is a case where we did an intersphincteric section on a patient that was not very continent. And so we did an intersphincteric APR closing the sphincter at, at the end. I have two more topics that are a little bit shorter. Shall I just continue to talk or am I over time? No, no, take your time. We're, yeah? okay. we're okay. fully good. <laughs> okay, cool. okay, good. So the next thing I wanna talk because I think the rectal surgery nowadays has, has many strategies. I think it's Thomas or Thomas Plus. You know, for us, Thomas, transanal surgery, minimal invasive surgery, it's not so difficult to do for, for small or bigger lesions going full thickness. But if you go full thickness, you have the chance of a bleeding, you have a chance of an abscess. And if you have to do a completion, total mesorectal excision afterwards, your margin might be screwed by a full thickness dissection. And so what I think what we should do is for those benign lesions or for early rectal cancer, we have to define upfront which plane we want, to, we want to use. And we definitely want to select patients where we want to avoid larger operations where not needed. And we see many patients that are referred to us in which they have biopsies that show no malignancy, but on MRR, on endo ultrasound, they say it's a T2 N0 lesion. So what do you do if you have a young patient? They say on MRR or endo ultrasound, they say it's a, a deep T1 or, or T2, but all biopsies are negative. You know, do you perform a TME? Do you perform, a, you know, full thickness? If you do a full thickness and there's an abscess afterwards and it, it comes out as a TME carcinoma, the completion total mesorectal excision is kind of screwed. So, so those are the issues we have, to, we have to talk about and to handle. I think many surgeons work and do a full thickness dissection, whereas it's very beautiful and very artistic to do a submucosal dissection or intermuscular dissection. So you really can say, for a benign lesion, I go submucosal. For a T1 lesion, I go intermuscular. I follow the patient and I see what happens. You can always do a, um, a completion resection. If you have a T2 lesion, but it's benign on biopsy, I would say, why don't go intermuscular, see what comes out, and then you can decide. And that's what we did on a patient 41 years old, female patient, two weeks ago, T2 N0 on MRR, on enter ultrasound, but biopsy is negative. We did a intermuscular dissection. It came out a benign, a benign disease. So the patient never had a radical surgery, surgery because she didn't have any cancer. And I just wanna show you a small video in a female patient, 82 years old, a lot of blood and mucus on endoscopy, probably benign disease, large villous lesion, pathology adenoma. Uh, what would you do? This is a female patient, big lesion. You can follow up the patient, but she has a lot of complaint. And I think it's very nice to don't have to do a full thickness dissection, but you can do a submucosal or intermuscular dissection. These are MRIs, so this is a very big lesion actually, but I went to the endoscopist, I saw the lesion, and the lesion was actually 
more flat and not that massive. I'll show you the video. So this is the video of the patient. You will see that it's like a big lesion. Um, it looks benign. It's a pretty big lesion. Some endoscopists can do this uh, EMR or ESD nowadays, but in our hospital, they are still a little bit scared to do this or it takes them four to six hours to do it. And so if you do this transanally with Thomas, it's pretty easy actually. It's not a long procedure. You just mark your polyp all the way around. So this is your circumferential resection margin with a Thomas port, a flexible port, using an air seal insufflator. You just mark the lesion all the way around. And then we use like a mixture of um, uh, a colloid plasma or, or, or a, a protein plasma, voluven with methylene blue and a little bit of adrenaline. And we just inject the blue within the layers in the submucosal area. And you can really easily see the muscle and go just above the muscle. You can also go in the muscle and you can go intermuscular, dissect off the transverse muscle and go between the transverse muscle and the longitudinal. But because this was in an 82 years old patient, benign lesion, we left the transverse muscle we injected the blue every time because it shows very nicely where to go. And then it's very easy. You just have to be careful. Sometimes you see like a little bit of a blood vessel going from the muscle, especially like here. There was a blood vessel here. So you have to be a little bit careful. Sometimes it starts to bleed a little bit, but it's much safer to do this as a surgeon, I think, than as an endoscopist or an EVA, at least faster. But with the dye, the blue dye, you can really see where you have to go. You can speed up. And this is not a very extensive procedure for the patient. This is day clinic or one night staying in the hospital for an 80 years old patient. You see the muscle, you really see where you are. You don't have to stitch it. So full thickness, we try to stitch, but if it's submucosal or intermuscular, we just leave it like this. And like a few weeks later, you don't even see where you were actually. So this is really a nice procedure for benign or early rectal cancer, I think. So I think this is something we have to keep in mind. Okay. The last strategy I want to discuss that has that we have as colorectal surgeons, but, but more when we don't have to or want to operate is the watch and wait strategy. Um, I was invited by Angelita Abregama uh, three times now in Brazil. Angelita, I think is now 92 years old. She had COVID, she had a tracheostomy. She survives and she's still alive and kicking and she still gives her beautiful conference every two years in Sao Paulo. I gave some lectures in Sao Paulo. This is Rodrigo Perez. And this is a present of mine, a hand in the colors of Brazil with the golden finger, like it's the golden bioprobe doing the digital exam. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of Angelita. In the beginning, when Angelita gave the talks in the United States, she was, she was pushed off the podium because they said, you know, you're crazy not to operate a rectal cancer after disappearing after knee adjuvant treatment. But of course, I think we now know that some selected patients are very good candidates to not operate and to just follow up. And for that, I think some issues are important. We started actually, and Angelita started actually with accidental complete clinical response. So they saw that some lesions just disappeared with new adjuvant treatment many years ago. Now we have better treatment regimens. We see a lot of nearly complete responses or complete responses. And now we came to the idea to intentionally look for a complete clinical response, especially in those patients where the lesion is very low and close to the sphincter or invading the sphincter, because then you can save the patient from doing an APR. We have to, go to, of course, do a digital exam. We have to do endoscopic evaluation. We have to be careful with biopsies after chemo radiation therapy, because the biopsies, 11 out of 36 in this publication were negative, but still had an incomplete pathological response. So although, they were negative when the specimen was taking out, still one out of three patients had an incomplete 
pathological response. So biopsies are not very useful. Radiological control, although the endoluminal component is much more important than the extraluminal component. So checking with MRR is more important to check the mesorectum and the bowel wall on the outer side to check for the lymph nodes actually. We need time. We need time for a complete clinical response. So if you judge your patients six weeks or eight weeks after knee adjuvant treatment, it's actually useless to decide whether the patient has a complete clinical response or not. It's useless because it takes time to come to a complete clinical response after radiochemotherapy. The median interval to come to a complete clinical response is 21 weeks. So if you decide after six to eight weeks that you have a incomplete response, you might be too early. But of course, if after six to eight weeks, there's no response, it will never be a complete response, okay? But it takes time. 37% of patients had a complete clinical response between 10 to 16 weeks. 73% of the patients had a complete response after 16 weeks. So more than three fourths of the patients, you had to wait, wait 15, 16, 17 weeks. This means that as long as you have a good progress, it might be a good chance to become a clinical response. Now, something we also know from literature, if you do a checkup after gamma radiation, after eight weeks, you have to have a tumor volume reduction on endoscopy or digital exam or both or MRR, three of them. You will need at least 75% of reduction after eight weeks. If it's less than 75%, it will never become a complete clinical response. So what we do now, and we are included in the Watch and Wait database, from Portugal and from Angelita Abagama, we check the patient after seven to eight weeks. If the volume reduction is more than 75%, we follow the patient, we tell the patient, this might be a complete clinical response, but we have to see, but we don't make any judgments earlier unless it has less than 75% of tumor reduction. Then it will never become a complete clinical response compared to literature. Also, it depends on the size of the tumor. If you have a T2 or T3A, it takes 19 weeks on average for a complete clinical response. If you have a bigger lesion, T3B to D or T4, on average, it takes 26 weeks. Although I have to say that T4 lesions, we try to avoid doing watch and wait. But if it's implemented in the sphincter, and it's a T3, B or C or D, we try to go for a maximal response before we decide. Why not operate all those patients? Because you will have a lot of um, um, collateral damage. When you perform a TME or APR on all those patients, morbidity is high, mortality is high, functional results are not that well, you need an APR in more than 10% of patients in literature, and you have a lot of stomas. So for very selective patients would have more than 75 volume reduction after eight weeks, and afterwards keep on decreasing the lesion, volume reduction keeps on till like 20 weeks, you could go to a watch and wait strategy. And this is then what we do. We see the patient, we do a digital exam, we do a blood sample, we do a CT two times a year. We do a blood sample four times a year. We do a sigmoidoscopy actually four times a year because it's three times sigmoidoscopy, one time colonoscopy, four times MRI. So patients come back every three months with a lot of examinations that if the patient escapes and the patient has a regrowth, you are there in time and you can still do rescue surgery for the patient. And I'll show you why. A regrowth is a growing of tumor at the initial place. So we don't say it's a local recurrence. Local recurrence means you operate it and the tumor comes back. 
a local regrowth means you didn't operate, you thought the lesion was gone, but at the time you check it, there's a regrowth, not a recurrence, but a regrowth. It was never gone actually. So we talk about a regrowth. The percentage of regrowth after you decided it was a complete clinical response, the number of regrowths are like about 20% in three years. So you have to tell your patient, you still have a 20% chance that after all, I have to operate you, you know? 80% chance you might never be operated. So especially in very old or very young patients, this is very helpful, but still a 20% chance that you will be operated. If they are after three years, the local regrowth chance decreases to less than 5%. So like after three years, there's a plateau in which you hardly ever see any regrowth actually. So you have to do endoscopic evaluation and MRR, although 90% of all the regrowths appear interluminal. So 90% of all the regrowths grow back into a luminal. So you really have to feel, and that's why most um, studies on watch and wait include only lesions that are within the reach of your finger and not higher up. And you have to do your endoscopic evaluation every three months to when you see something grow, it will not be scar, it will be cancer. And then you have to operate afterwards. So you have to tell the patient, so these are the risk factors. Of course, a bigger lesion has more chance of a regrowth, but actually only relevant in the first year. After the first year, a T1, T2, T3, T4 have the same amount of regrowth. But in the first year, it's mainly the T3s and the T4s that do a regrowth after complete clinical response. Um, they say that in literature that the end stage is not an increased risk for local regrowth. And that's always a discussion on our MDTs that if you see lymph nodes disappear, you see the tumor disappear, we feel more scared to implement a patient with positive lymph nodes at the beginning to implement and watch and wait strategy. But according to literature, it's not a higher chance if also the lymph nodes disappeared, of course. Is there still sulfate surgery? So around 20% of patients still need surgery afterwards. You have to tell your patient. And if you are there in time and you follow up the patient very closely, in more than 90% of patients, you can still do the same operation with the same results, but you have to be there in time. If you have any doubts, maybe then you do a biopsy to be sure, or you have to talk to a young patient that you really have to do an operation because something growing in your rectum is not a scar, it will be cancer. I think this is very important. The aspect of scattering, scattering is a principle that when you have a mass of tumor and you do, you start neoadjuvant radio chemotherapy, it is, it is not that the mass will like go higher up in the rectum. We think that the mass does not I mean, goes more inside the rectum that will be more kind of islands or of, of rectal cancer spread in that area where the mass was. So we think that the strategy for surgery should be made before the knee adjuvant chemo radio th radiotherapy starts. So we judge our patients, all of our patients, the complete responders, the wash and waste, the surgery patients before they go to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So it's free of the sphincter at the start, it will stay free of the sphincter at the start. But if it's invading the sphincter from the start, afterwards you might think that it's not invading the sphincter, but it could be that the patient has scattering. So there might be still some islands of mucoid tumor in the sphincter. So that's a scary thing, I think. What about metastasis? There's not a higher risk of metastasis when you do a watch and wait strategy compared to radical surgery. So if you follow up your patient closely, there's not a higher chance, but which is very important, if you have a patient 
that does a regrowth. So the patient does a regrowth. It means that the cancer grew again. Then you should operate immediately. So if you have any doubts, then you wait another three months or another six months while there's something growing in the rectum. Those patients are at risk for metastasis. So I think this is very crucial. If you want to do watch and wait and you don't have a patient that can come to follow up because he lives far away from your hospital or he's not very disciplined, it's impossible to do good watch and wait and you might up ending with metastasis in a patient that was curable from the start actually. So I think to conclude about watch and wait, um, there's still a lot of accidental watch and wait for a little bit mid-rectal cancers. Um, they will have um, radio chemotherapy in some cases anyway. And if they do a complete response, that's perfect. You know, This is something different than the intent, intentional watch and wait for lesions that are very low, very close to the sphincter, where you really want to aim high, have a maximum response, where you really want to implement TNT, total knee adjuvant therapy, by either a schedule like the OPRA trial or the RAPIDO trial to increase the number of um, complete clinical responders and to give, for example, a young patient the chance to avoid an APR, you know, but you have to discuss with your patient. I think that is my last slide. So I, I still think that is very exciting. I think it's very exciting to follow the conferences, to have an open interaction with the whole staff, to keep each other updated and to really talk to the patient which strategy you want to, to use, um, mainly to um, preserve the rectum or even the sphincter in as many patients uh, as you can. Um, so I, I think I can talk for hours. I can talk another two hours, but I think this was actually the, the main thing to, to tell you today, uh, which, which you asked, uh, Sean, I think. Okay, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Please, if you have sure. a question, raise your hand. Any questions, raise your hand. There's a question, yeah. There's a question in the chat, I think. But there's also somebody raising the hand on the lower screen. So there's a question in the chat. So for advanced cases, we can wait for up to 16 weeks after neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy under cover of chemotherapy or just close follow up? Yeah, well, you know, in, in some cases we, we add chemotherapy, but I think you have to decide kind of kind of upfront. If you look at the, at the OPRA trial, they had like three arms comparing um, prolonged chemotherapy. And if you gave more chemotherapy, the chance of having a watch and wait was, was higher. And the same actually is for the RAPIDO trial. So originally I think they gave nine cycles of chemotherapy, but most Belgian uh, hospitals give six cycles. But if it's a very good response, now some hospitals give another three cycles, especially a young patient to try to have maximal response, yeah. Okay, Dr. Met Hatkafagi. Thank you very much for this informative lecture. I'm wondering uh, how often do you do the correctomy for local recurrence after extent excision involving the lower sacrum? How many times you do sacrectomy for a year? A few, and what are your results if you do it? We do we don't we don't do much actually, but we don't have many patients. That, that have invasions of the sacrum actually. So Kurt van der Speter does. The local like regrowth. Only, but for local regrowth, well, if we have local regrowth, we, we want to be there very, very early. So if we follow the patient every three months, it should be a small lesion. So then we never do a sacrectomy in those patients, but we do sacrectomies for T4s from, from the start that invade the sacrum, but not for the regrowth. Is that, is that sure. okay, or, or did I answer your question? Okay, or? and so you, you rarely do it, right? Yes, absolutely. 
If you stick to the strict uh, follow-up criteria uh, every three months, then you yes. will not need. Uh, no, uh, but I, 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 yeah, I but think sometimes you know, we we'll get patients from other centers. Yeah, we are neglected yes. in the follow-up, and so we are obliged to do secrectomy for this patient. Yes, of course that's well, that's horrible, of course, but. But if we patients come to it's our not hospital, that horrible. It, it's not a difficult operation, so long no. as you are below sacred two. Yes, yes, yes. But we, we don't yeah. uh, perform that very often. But I think you need for watch and wait, you need patients that really come to you and that are followed by you. But of course, we see also sometimes patients coming from, uh, from other hospitals. But of course, you have a much bigger country. So I think the distance might be might be more difficult in your country than than in Belgium. Belgium is a small country. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Doctor Wani. Uh, thank you, Doctor Noel, from a very excellent talk, especially thank the you. data that you presented from your center. Thank you. Uh, I think you explained it well, but I just want to know from you, uh, from your experience, I think we all have dealt with patients who have a, like very narrow pelvis, males, obese, uh, any like practical OT theater oriented trips that you can use to kind of engage the distal stapler line while you are dividing the distal rectum. Uh, I'm sure majority of us must have come through scenarios wherein the staple, you just cannot engage it. It's a practical issue. Well, I, I think now, well, it's a, it's a very practical issue because you cannot make that angulation, which I showed you. And then most surgeons go to a, like a vertical stapling, but sometimes you have a more posterior lesion, which is like uh, within that last two centimeters of the rectum and most, most staplers, even the robotic staplers is 1.2 centimeters wide. So mm. if you have less than that 1.2 centimeters, it's, it's even impossible. So the, the big hype now in Europe, I don't know in the rest of the world, the big hype in Europe is the, is the technique of TTSS as showed by Antonino Spinelli. No, Spinelli technically. But of course, you know, I've seen him try to perform this in a very male obese patient and he, he, he had to stop because it was impossible actually. And then I think still maybe I have a big bias, but then in those cases, if you can do TATME or TATA from, from uh, Gerald Marx in the old days, and you can free up the rectum for like a few centimeters, uh, you can overcome that problem. But then of course you have to do a manual anastomosis um, if you cannot do a purse string on it. So, so the, the tricks is actually um, not, I think the same as what you do, try to free it up circumferentially until the pelvic floor. If you cannot get a stapler across, I think you have to do a kind of a TTSS or, or TATA. What is TTSS uh, short for? It, well, TTSS is, I don't really know the, the abbreviation. It's, it's like a transfer trans transaction and single, single stapler. Single stapler. So what they do actually is they go down. They deliver the specimen transactively and then divide it. Yeah, it's a little bit like, like TATME. But they yeah. don't dissect. They don't dissect uh, laparoscopically or endoscopically from above. They just try to get down to the pelvic floor, and then from from below they kind of uh, circumferentially incise the rectal wall, then take it out, and they try to then with a purse swing staple it together, or do a manual anastomosis. So it it's actually like we do the last part of the TATME, but then you know, only for the only for the anastomotic part actually. I don't yeah, know. I, I don't, I don't think there country. are any easy answers here. Yes. Sorry. Uh, this is a situation like that's very frequently encountered, and I really like hope there was an easy answer here. But as we know, no, no, uh, no it's no easy answer. I, so, yeah, so I, what I, we are trying frequently is we are trying to make the initial cut in the rectum with a maybe a thirty mm vascular stapler just to get that angle going. And then maybe use 245s or 160. But uh, as we can, like all of us can recollect that it's like easier said than done. And intraoperative would, difficulties are. Did, did, did you ever see a experienced TATME surgeon overcome that problem? Do you ever see it live in a hospital or somewhere or not? 
No, we have surgeons who have been proctored by people who are doing TATME frequently. Okay. But then majority of the practice is still, you know, the conventional LAR uh, through the trans transabdominal approach. Yes. I, I, I think for those lesions, those low, those low lesions, I, I still love to perform TATME, but not as high as I can, just, just to overcome the last little bit, you know, just to overcome the problem zone, actually. Even with the robot, because the robot Do has you... also a staple of 1.2 centimeters wide. And most robotic surgeons, if you look at a robotic video, they always do a vertical stapling because they kind of have the same problem to get the robot down to the pelvic floor in those obese male patients, you know? The, the vertical orientation of the stapler like kind of blinds you somewhere, Yanni. I'm not sure. I, kind I, of agree. Blind... I agree, but I think like in 80% of the robotic cases for rectal cancer, you will see that they, they staple it off um, vertically. And I agree that with the robot, you can mobilize a little, a little further. A little you can more. Really dissect on, on the upper border of the sphincter, but you still have to get your 1.2 centimeter stapler between the tumor and, and the lower border of the cancer, actually. So those are the difficult cases, of course. But we, in my country, you know, many people come and they, they really want to avoid APR or, or, or permanent stoma. So people come from, from even from Italy or from other places. And they say, you know, in my country where it's like warm all day, like in the southern part of Europe, you know, a stoma for me is a big, big problem. Can you just try to put it together? And I actually, I didn't show you the functional results, but our functional results are really, really good. I think, you know, we don't have Lars in so many patients, you know. Mm. But you have to, you have to know that if you start TATME, you need a good proctor for five to 10 cases and you need to, to go to like 30 patients before you are experienced to do all of them. Same for robotic actually, I think. But Any feedback from the panel, from the attendees who deal with rectal surgery about how to deal with the narrow pelvis? Anything that they do differently? Dr. Hichau, your center? Yes. Uh... No, I think the the same which Dr. Ruknol said. Uh, nothing. I have nothing to add. How how many robots do you have? I mean, are there a lot of centers with robots, or or, or not too many? Or no, no, we are not accessible. Robot is not accessible at the center where I'm working currently. And the majority of the work is still laparoscopic, and as you and it must be or the laparoscopy and down under in a male pelvis, it gets a little bit crowded and the workspace is really restricted. If I, if I operate in Italy and, and, and also uh, not too long ago in my own hospital, in Italy, we all, we all just have the laparoscope and it's a private hospital. They won't buy the robot. And then we sometimes for very low lesions for young, young patients, we, we still perform TAT me there, but also in my own hospital, you have seen the data of the last two years, more than 30% still done TAT me, but especially for those patients in the last two centimeters, where you have to start in an open fashion, then you introduce the platform, and then you can start your TATME just for a few centimeters, just to overcome that problem in the last five centimeters of the rectum. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nath. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, Dr. Walid Akman. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi, thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation. I was wondering, is it possible to do a TATME for uh, type 3 or yellow rectal cancer with invasion of the internal sphincter? Well, if, if it's a young patient and it's attached to the internal sphincter, I take one third of the internal sphincter. Yeah, I do that for very young patients with a very good sphincter muscle, I go kind of intersphincteric and take a little bit of intersphincteric muscle. But if it's like halfway inter in, uh, internal sphincter or invading the external sphincter, it's impossible, you know? I know that like- Yes, it's impossible towards the external. Yeah, but if it's completely internal, I, you know, I think the functional results are so bad. I know like Eric Rullier takes part of the inter internal sphincter like very low. 
but I think it's a very big risk for functional results. But we take the top of the internal sphincter if we have to, yeah, in young patients. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Dr. Naeem. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Magid and uh, Dr. Kano. Fantastic presentation, very informative. You, and we, I have been following your iLab column with the videos from Liu Jiboni and uh, Steve Wagner yes. with you. My yes. question is: My question is uh, that uh, do you preserve? Um, is it your routine, or you don't do it? The left colic while you are doing the TME. And the second question is that. Uh, do you always mobilize the splenic flexor of the colon or this is your per operative decision when you see that uh, the anastomosis or there might be a tension on it? So these are my two questions. Is there any rule of thumb of yours while you do the splenic flexor mobilization or you, uh, it varies case to case? Thank you. I, yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you, sir. I, I actually mobilize the splenic flexor, I would say in all cases, but if there's really like a, a left colon that's like in the way, like a one loop, two loops that you, you know, it's, it's really in the way, I would, I would not mobilize a splenic flexure. But in like 95% of cases, I will definitely mobilize a splenic flexure. Now, what I've seen around the world, it's very strange thing is that like there's, there seems to be geographical differences in, in patients. I was operating in Russia and they told me we never mobilize the splenic flexure because Russian people have a longer colon. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But indeed, I operated three patients in St. Petersburg and I didn't have to mobilize the splenic flexure. But in Belgium, in Belgium, I have to mobilize the splenic flexure in 95% of patients. And the way I do it um, is very standardized. And I think it's very nice on ILAP surgery that the video is uncut or it's, it's, it's cut, but it's very nicely divided in parts in the ILAP colon part with colorized parts. So it's very nice, I think. But so I mobilized in 95% of patients. And if I mobilize it completely and I, I have any doubts about the length, I take the AMI, inferior mesenteric artery, really at the base. So, you know, that, so then I go lower than my left colic artery, actually. Then I don't save my left colic artery. Although in Amsterdam, people from Amsterdam, they say you can mobilize the splenic flexure completely and save the left colic. But in my experience, I, I still need some length then. I, I don't know what your experience is. Uh, thank you very much. So our experience varies. I am actually working with a surgeon uh, who used to be the trainee of Amjad Parviz. And uh, he oh, also cool. visits, yeah, he visits the Chapelle Mount uh, Foundation as well. So uh, yeah, his practice is always to mobilize the splenic flexor of uh, colon. And, uh, and then um, as far as the diversion ileostomy is concerned, we always, because I am working with, we always have some choices. We had leaks recently and uh, yeah, we had the conversions. So uh, regarding the diversion ileostomies, uh, what is your criteria, the indications? Is it also perioperatively while you are forming the anastomosis or you have preoperative decisions about them? Uh, that's, that's a very good question because there are all kind of algorithms trying to calculate the risk for a patient, but I think it's bullshit because you know it's, it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to calculate it by, by an algorithm. Um, I work very closely together with the group of Amsterdam and in the Netherlands, they try to avoid a stoma in all patients. You know, they try to. And then they say, we do it only selectively. And if they have a leak, they put in an endosponge or they do a pull through like a terminal cutate, uh, but mostly an endosponge. Now I've been a visitor and doing like a lecture there and they had multiple patients, multiple patients on the ward with endosponges. Now, I'm very stressed. If I have one or two patients with endosponge, I'm very stressed, you know? I don't feel very well about it because the functional result is worse. And therefore, definitely all patients that are radi irradiated, especially male patients, all get ileostomy in my hospital. I rather have ileostomy for six to eight weeks and then do a test and um, uh, close the ileostomy then 
worst sleeping nights and endless punches. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, it's like a fluctuation in time. Sometimes you think you're, you're Superman and then you, then you don't have eleostomy. And then as Superman, you fall down, you know, and then you come back to earth and you say, you know, I better have eleostomy. So we have eleostomies on, on all patients that are irradiated. And in Belgium, many patients are irradiated for rectal cancer. So most patients get, uh, get the ileostomy. So what other indications are there for the ileostomy? When do you perform an ileostomy? Well, if it's, if, it's, if it's a TME and it's irradiated, definitely. If it's, not TME, if, if it's TME and not, not irradiated, and I think the operation went well and didn't have any problems, I would, I would not do a diversion. But all patients that are irradiated, we do diverting. I don't know what, what's your opinion about that. I think we do this the same. If a patient has uh, an adjuvant therapy, then uh, probably better to do. Uh, an I think so, yes. In some countries, I think in Norway, and I also think another country I, I give lectures, it's like a national guideline. They say, you know, irradiated patients this age, always diversion. There's no argue, you know. Some people, some countries have like national guidelines. We don't have, but you know, also you have a, if a leak, you have a leak, you have an endospoint, and uh, you know that's that's a uh, that's a difficult thing, I think. What's what's when your you experience do... with with Turnbull cutate? Do you ever do that? Like a we, pull we... through through the anus? Yeah, we do it sometimes. I, I don't do it, but I have colleagues who do it. I saw it many times at our place. I, I don't do it planned, but I had, a le I had a patient that had a retraction of a manual anastomosis like two, three weeks ago. So the whole anastomosis retracted and I mobilized it again. And then I took it out and the patient does very well. So I left it there for six days and then did a new manual anastomosis. The patient is good, but it's very, very, very rare, very selective. Yeah, when you do a stapler anastomosis, do you take a second layer of uh, hand sewing over it or you no. just just no. a stapler? Yeah, just a stapler. I'm a bit scared of devascularizing it, uh, you know, to make it worse. But I do ICG. Yeah. Do you do ICG? Everybody does ICG or not? We still don't have it. We're so, we, we should have it in the future. In the, yeah, I think it's good. When they open. Yeah. But you do good. ICG routinely? Routinely. Yeah. So in all cases, all cases, yes. But uh, I, I, but but they checked ICG from different companies, and there's a big difference. So if you have like Storz towel with ICG, it's not that good, you know. So then you buy better buy a, a separate ICG system from Strike or from Pinpoint. Not not all ICGs are the same. Okay, so what's the best ICG? You said Striker. I think I think the best ICG now is Striker. Yes. 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 Okay. Hopefully we get it in the future. Yes, I think it's good. Yes, for your next Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Dr. Gamal Amero. Uh, thank you for these very nice uh, lectures. Uh, my question is about uh, what and wait. Have you mentioned that we should wait for about at least 20 weeks after the end of the uh, uh, the protocol? We wait for 20 weeks? Well, it, uh, on if, average... If they are well, responded after uh, eight weeks with more than 75%, what is indeed. the ideal time to wait? Well, I, I think... I think you have to know that on average, it takes about 20 weeks, you know, to have a complete yeah. clinical response. Clinical means you don't see the lesion anymore. But yeah. we know also from literature, and that's what we count on, is that if what you say indeed is true, if after eight weeks, you don't yes. have 75% volume reduction, it will never be the complete responder. So if you have a patient after eight, seven to eight weeks with the volume, that is not reducted 75%, operate, just operate, okay? 
is, is the protocol different between new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy or to give uh, the full uh, treatment for watch and wait? Is there a difference between the two, new adjuvant or uh, who you judge to, to, to uh, which cases you, you judge that they, they are fit for watch and wait? Before before surgery, well, I I think I think actually any patient which has only tumor T one T two T three maybe T four so one to three four selectively and only some positive nodes. If you have like EMVI or you have tumor deposits where you really can see how the lesion goes up to metastasis, I don't think it's very, you know, it's very logic to do that. But for us, all patients that are within the reach of the finger, so the last part of the rectum that can be followed up and can come to the hospital on a regular basis for between T, T3 and two and everything below that is a candidate. You know, if it's yeah. higher, we just operate. If it's a higher lesion than the finger, it just operate. You know, we, we should not become scared to operate. No, it's okay to operate. Yes. Thank but, you. But, but there's always discussions. And our NDT is always the big discussions about it, you know. And yes. if we have any doubt, is there any doubt? We also operate. With doubt, operate. Yes. Because you don't want and, to... And, and, and... Yeah, and, and, and how much is the real percent who uh, don't need surgery later on? Is it 30% or less than that? Who... Well, it's, it, it's very impressive. Your... If, 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 you look mm. at, if, you, if you look at the results from the TNT, the results from Oprah trial, you know, when we started like a long course radio chemotherapy, like the standard long course, the, the chance of a complete clinical response was between 15 and 20%. With, yes. with, with the OPRA trial from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, it, it went up to between 30 and 40%. But I, I have some doubts about that, but it, I think it can go up to 30%, but still of that 30%, 20% of 30%, you know, does agree growth, so still has to be operated. So Thank one you. fifth, one five, mm. one one out of five of that twenty of that thirty percent actually. Um, but of course, never wait too long and watch and wait because the patient that you have doubts and something is growing and you don't know what to do and you know you wait for another three more four months. A patient goes uh, for a holiday for two months and comes back. Those are the patients that will metastasis probably. Yes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Rani? Uh, I want some final comments from uh, Dr. Noel. What is your practical selection criteria for patients? Like who to who should undergo a long course chemo and a short course chemo, this radiotherapy? And uh, regarding the TNT sequencing, do you have any practical criteria for selecting like which patient should undergo upfront chemo radiation or upfront chemotherapy followed by radiation? Do you have any practical, like how do you select your patients for this? Yeah, I, yeah that's, that's the number one question maybe, you know, because we, we try to work on an algorithm for that. And the algorithm that we, we work on is the algorithm they, they're using in uh, the University of Toronto, but also in uh, Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. And they, they try to, and they're, they're heading more towards um, um, induction chemotherapy for patients that have high risk factors like EMVI, uh, tumor deposits, um, and two, they say, no, we do induction therapy. So they start with chemo and then they do chemo radiation, you know? All the other patients, they do consolidation uh, chemo radiation. So it depends on where your chemo radiation is, whether you call the chemo induction or consolidation. 
So high risk factors like EMVI, T2, tumor deposits, uh, they start with GEMO and then do GEMO radiation. In all the other patients, they do GEMO radiation and then consolidation GEMO therapy. In old frail patients, and we try to follow that as good as we can, but we are working on an algorithm. On old frail patients that cannot have the whole cyclist, only for those patients, we do short course radiotherapy. For the patients, of course, where you don't want to go to watch and wait, if it's a T2, T3, N0 lesion in the mid rectum or five, six, seven centimeters from the um, anorectal junction, we just operate primarily. That's, that's roughly how we do it. Uh, so if I understand it correctly, your criteria for selecting long, short course chemotherapy is only frailty, yeah. right? Frailty, yes. Although if you go to the Scandinavian countries, a lot of people yeah. get only short course radiation. But in Belgium, it's, it's, it's depending a bit on the country, I think. The, the data for short course, chemo short course radiotherapy is also quite uh, robust. Yes, it is. Definitely. Definitely. But, but like in, in the US in, and in Europe, I think besides Scandinavia, I think most people go for maximum response. Maximum response and the chance of a complete response. Yeah, the longer of the course time we, of the radiotherapy, the better the response. Yeah. Yes. Now, a different question to all of you. Do you have access to that second talk, like to a Thomas port? to submucosal dissection or full thickness, or do you do that? Like submucosal or intermuscular dissection? Uh, that's the only thing that you didn't ask questions on, but do you have access to the to the port and, and can you do it? Or is it not accessible in- uh, Here in Egypt, Egypt we, we, have, uh, we, we have trouble finding the port. So like oh, okay. some, some of my colleagues had their thesis about uh, transanal TME. And they had only one port, and they used to uh, use, reuse it, keep reusing it until it oh, was leaking right. all the time. So yes. Yes. we have financial, of course, issues. Yes. Uh, That's something I, I love to do. It's a beautiful plane with the blue dye. It's very nice to do that. But you should, of course, you need access for that. Okay. I have a question. Do you know anything about uh, inferior ar mesenteric artery preservation in cases of sigmoid and rectal cancer? Like to do instead of ligating the inferior mesenteric artery, just to do a lymphadenectomy and try to preserve. Uh... Yes, yes. I never do that. I know. I know some people do that, but I never do that. Okay. I never do that. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Dr. Yop. I think uh, this is the end of the of the webinar. <laughs> we appreciate your uh, presentation. It was really wonderful. And uh, thank you very much. If you have the time later in the future and you want to do another webinar, you're always welcome. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of presentations, so I, you know, I I love to discuss and to see what other surgeons do. So I uh, thank you very much for for listening and uh, very nice. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nolan. I uh, hope to see you again at our webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good bye evening. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.